Good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening wherever you are in the world. My name is John Matic and I'm speaking to you from Sydney, Australia. It is nine o'clock on Thursday morning, August 22 here. I presume it's August 21 for most of you in the Northern Hemisphere, um, at least in the United States. So uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, the unexpectedly uh, important role of RNA regulation in human development and uh, to try to convince you that we've fundamentally misunderstood the structure of uh, genetic programming of humans and other complex organisms for the past 50 years or so because of the simple and apparently reasonable assumption at the time that most genes encode proteins. That uh, assumption uh, turns out to be largely true for simple organisms like bacteria whose genomes are comprised wall to wall of protein coding sequences, but not to be true for complex organisms, including humans or particularly humans, where uh, it's unfolding that most genes in our genome actually encode regulatory RNAs. What I'd like to do with you is take you for a bit of a journey through this, um, uh, this area. Excuse me, I've just got to resize my window. Um, and uh, begin with uh, the, the simple observation that was uh, uh, surprisingly um, uh, uncommented on by many uh, people in developmental biology. And that is that we humans, and, and indeed all other animals, not just vertebrates, have roughly the same number of protein coding genes as uh, a simple nematode worm, C. elegans. Now that's a slight exaggeration because C. elegans appears to have about 19 and a half thousand protein coding genes and as I'll show you we probably have of the order of 23 or 24,000 but the important point is that most of these genes that we share with worms and in fact all other animals uh, are orthologous and that is they encode proteins that have similar functions. So most of the genes that are in, uh, involved in human development that are uh, mutated in things like cancer actually have orthologs in a very simple animals, not just nematodes, but in fact the most primitive of all animal sponges. So the question arises, where is the uh, information that programs our complexity? And before I go on to answer that question in more detail, I just want to put something to you as an audience, and that is to consider the differences between this worm on the right of this picture here, C. elegans, which in fact is only one millimetre long, and the, the animal on the left, that's us, the humans, uh, that have uh, an extraordinarily sophisticated complex uh, development and cognitive um, capacities. The worm on the right uh, only has uh, roughly 1,000 somatic cells, a few muscle cells, a few nerve cells in the gut. And yet, and the one on the left has at least 10 trillion somatic cells uh, exquisitely arranged into a myriad of different muscles and bones and organs, etc including a brain with uh, something like 100 billion neurons, each with an average of 10,000 meaningful connections. And yet, to first approximation, and there are clade-specific uh, expansions in, in protein space, but to first approximation, we have roughly the same number and roughly the same repertoire of protein coding genes. Now, I think the important thing to, to the point to make at this point is to draw a distinction between uh, transcription factors and the world I'm going to introduce you to. Transcription factors are extremely powerful state-specific effectors. For example, Yamanaka factors can rewind cells back into a basic stem cell-like state. There are other transcription factors that are mesoderm-specific and others like my MyOD, which are muscle-specific. So when a cell needs to be uh, differentiated into a particular state during our ontogeny or at the end of the process, then particular transcription factors are turned on to affect that process. And, and of course, there's always an interplay between regulatory proteins and other aspects of the regulatory hierarchy that I'll talk about. But the real issue for humans, I think, uh, is not so much cell type specification, but rather the uh, exquisite architecture of the system. Every, every muscle in your face has a different architecture. Every bone in your fingers or your vertebrae uh, have a different architecture. Same cell type. So the amount of information required to program human ontogeny is, not, is far greater than that required simply for cell type specification. And I think uh, the amount of information required to program the architecture of the system is, is far greater than most people would have uh, expected. 
Now, uh, the, the usual uh, assumption in developmental biology is that the combinatorics of transcription factors and other regulatory proteins gives you sufficient scaling power to program anything from a worm to a human. But that, in, in fact, is just a, an assumption that's never been justified mechanistically by reference to decision theory or uh, mathematically. But be that as may, the question remains, where is the information that programs the complexity of a human? Now, the only, the only thing that does scale with broadly with developmental complexity is the relative amount of non-protein coding intronic and intergenic sequences. This is a graph that we produced some years ago. We've just published an update of this recently with many more sequence genomes. And the important point to make about this graph before I uh, talk you through it is that this is based on sequenced uh, genomic data and compares the relative proportion of non-coding DNA to total DNA in the genomes of different organisms. And they're simply ranked by increasing amounts of non-protein coding, presumably regulatory DNA. So when you look at this graph, and it hasn't changed with the update, you see that simple organisms like bacteria have you know, roughly 10 to 15 percent non-protein coding DNA, largely uh, 5 prime and 3 prime uh, sequences that uh, regulate transcription and translation. When you move into the eukaryotes, even simple eukaryotes like yeast or plasmodium, you move up above 25%, pushing up to 50. More complex fungi like neurospora, well above 50% non-coding DNA. And then you move variably into the plants, uh, the invertebrates and up to the vertebrates, topping out with humans at 98.8% non-protein coding DNA. Now, it's important to, 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 to mention at this point, because there is some controversy about this, that this graph corrects for ploidy. And many of the examples that are quoted of organisms that have more DNA per cell than humans, in fact, turn out to be polyploid. So may not be more genetically complex, but there's a long way to go in terms of understanding the space. But superficially, the only thing that does scale with developmental complexity is the amount of non-protein coding DNA. Now this proves nothing but does suggest that there may have been an important and, and maybe uh, underestimated expansion in the regulatory sequences that are required to orchestrate the uh, differential expression patterns of this uh, essentially common set of protein components uh, as we move up the complexity hierarchy. Now, and I don't think anybody listening to this or thinking about this problem would disagree with the proposition that the one of the important differences, perhaps the most important difference between us and a uh, simple nematode worm, uh, is the uh, a much more sophisticated regulatory hierarchy that orchestrates the, the expression of these components to make a much more sophisticated organism. Now, I hasten to say um, that, that there is no suggestion here from me or anyone else that there are clade-specific expansions in particular protein families and innovations in protein uh, space as we move through the evolutionary hierarchy but primarily that uh, at face value uh, with a relatively common part set, it's actually the regulatory superstructure which is scaled during um, evolution and, and in development of humans. Now, when you look at this graph, um, the, the only thing that, uh, that comes across is that apart from a massive expansion in the intronic and intergenic sequences is that uh, we now know, and I'll show you the data for this in a moment, is that irrespective of the extent of non-coding sequences in these genomes, whether we're talking about C. elegans and nematode worm or fruit flies or mice or humans, that these sequences are all transcribed into RNA, most of which, or increasingly uh, higher proportions of which, do not go on to be translated to protein. Now, I'm going to show you the evidence for this, but at face value, if you, you, you take that statement at face value, then you're faced with a stark choice. Either uh, and this choice was uh, evident even back in the late 1970s when introns were first discovered. Uh, it was even evident then that there was an awful amount of transcription uh, of RNA from the genome which doesn't, didn't go on to be translated. So you're forced to the conclusion that, that either the human genome and those uh, genomes of other complex organisms are replete with useless transcription or these uh, unexpected non-protein coding RNAs are fulfilling some unexpected function. These are the only two real choices. So let's uh, look at this, uh, the evidence for the transcription first of all. <coughs> and this goes back to the, uh, really, the, the foundation papers uh, came about with the high throughput sequencing projects carried out at places like Yeevrekin and Yokohama and other places. 
And the big papers came out in 2005, including this one led by Piero Carnici, who I think is speaking elsewhere in the series. Uh, and we were part of this consortium. And uh, this paper published in Science in uh, 2005, uh, which was motivated by using high throughput sequencing in messenger RNA to try to uh, uncover uh, more of the, the proteome and the spliceome, um, surprisingly uh, found uh, that there were tens of thousands of transcripts of little or no protein coding potential. In the accompanying paper, we showed that uh, at least 70%, we were looking at mice, of, or mouse genes exhibited overlapping antisense transcripts and presented the first evidence that perturbation of these transcripts uh, might uh, have uh, regulatory, well, these transcripts might have regulatory uh, consequences because perturbation of them altered uh, the expression of surrounding or adjacent uh, messenger RNAs. A couple of months earlier, um, the Tom Gingeris and colleagues out in Metrix uh, showed, using a totally different technology, genome tiling arrays, showed the same thing. And because their approach didn't require purification of polyadenylated messenger RNAs, they also uh, reconfirmed an old observation which had been forgotten that, excuse me, almost half of all transcripts in uh, detectable in human cells were not polyadenylated and comprised a largely distinct set of sequences. So for a generation, almost half of the entire transcriptional output of the human genome has been uh, under the radar for technical reasons and is still largely uh, unexplored. But it uh, looks as if these things may be coming from pole three promoters rather than pole three promoters and uh, represent another layer of genetic information that we still don't understand. Now, even at the time, this is now seven years ago, when we were looking at this data, it was evident that the mammalian transcriptome, rather than being you know, gene one, gene two, gene three, a la E. coli, was in fact an extraordinarily complicated, complex uh, uh, landscape of interlacing and overlapping sense and antisense transcripts on both strands that were both protein coding and non-coding. And, and uh, you know, this diagram indicates we have genes within introns of other genes on the other strand. We have small uh, and large non-coding RNAs being encoded in introns of protein coding and non-coding transcripts, et cetera. And, and even in 2006, this cartoon that we drew to try to summarize what was coming out of these high throughput sequencing projects was an underestimate of the actual uh, complexity of the system. And in every cell, uh, there's not only different promoters, different splice patterns and different polyadenylation sites, but a different relationship between the expression patterns of surrounding transcripts. In other words, this dynamic landscape is dynamic in every respect when you move through different cells at different stages of development. Now, I want to illustrate this uh, and, and just to, to show you how far we've got to go to understand both the protein coding and non-coding transcriptome of human cells by showing you some uh, data that we published a year or so ago in conjunction with John Rin from Harvard and Jeff Jedlow from Roche Nimblegen. And it's called RNA capture sequencing, which is uh, the kind of the RNA sequencing equivalent of exome uh, sequencing. And perhaps before I go on to this, I should just, uh, just say to, to, to those in the audience that uh, I'm largely today not talking about microRNAs, which are very important, but very small subset of this enormous world of regulatory RNAs that we're uncovering through high throughput sequencing. I'm largely talking about what we refer to as long non-coding RNAs, which are arbitrarily defined as uh, uh, RNAs that are longer than 200 nucleotides, but which do not uh, code for proteins. And that cutoff is both a convenient biochemical cutoff as well as uh, taking out all of the smaller RNAs, including transfer RNAs, small nuclear RNAs, microRNAs, etc., that fall below 200 nucleotides. These long non-coding RNAs that I'm going to show you um, are actually vary anywhere from a couple of hundred nucleotides up to a couple of hundred thousand nucleotides, extraordinarily large RNAs whose functions are just beginning to be un unraveled. But returning to the narrative and this capture ray, we, we uh, started to look in detail at the, at the transcriptional landscape from particular genomic loci uh, by uh, uh, capturing uh, in normal RNA sec preparations all the transcripts that are coming from particular region by hybridizing them to uh, initially uh, flat arrays, but now beta arrays 
that actually will take out of the population all of the transcripts coming from a particular relevant part of the genome, in just the same way that we do exome sequencing to focus on the prone encoding sequences of the human genome for genetic analysis. So you see the diagram there, we just uh, make capture rays that, uh, high, low, that uh, target the region of particular interest. We capture the transcripts from these sequences and then we elute and sequence them. Now, uh, this diagram here uh, comes from our paper in Nature Biotech last year, where we used this uh, initially to examine transcription in intergenic loci that appear to be gene deserts by conventional RNA sequencing. And our motivation for doing this experiment was uh, partly at least the fact that there was at the time then some controversy about whether scattered sequence tags in RNA sequence analyses were actually um, uh, evidence of just random transcription, transcriptional noise, or as we preferred to think at the time, uh, just undersampled regions of the genome because sequencing depth wasn't large enough. So in this diagram here, uh, the outside, th this circos plot with these different colored uh, segments, uh, each represent uh, a region of the genome that appeared to be poorly transcribed in fibroblasts. So we've done a conventional um, uh, high, high, um, you know, high throughput uh, DNA, RNA sequencing from, from fibroblasts, assembled the transcripts and then uh, selected these regions where there was little or no evidence of uh, transcription. So if you, if you look at the bottom left segment there, on the outside uh, of the ring, there's, there's no evidence of transcription. You look further around, you'll see scattered um, uh, 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 evidence of transcription. And by the way, these arches represent splice junctions uh, against this part of the genome. Now that's what we saw on the outside with conventional RNA sequencing. But when we took exactly the same cDNA preparation, exactly the same preparation, and absorbed uh, the transcripts which were coming from these particular regions on, on the array by array capture, and then eluded and resequenced those, what we found and what we could assemble by way of transcripts is shown in the inner circle in blue. And you see an extraordinarily complex landscape of transcripts coming from these regions that appeared by conventional state-of-the-art deep sequencing but transcriptionally silent. Now this says several things about, about the system. First of all, that there are clearly subpopulations of cells, even in fibroblasts in culture, which are expressing uh, a different repertoire of, of, of genes. And, you know, it, this is not necessarily surprising in retrospect because even though one thinks of fibroblasts in culture as being relatively, relatively homogeneous, it's clear that there are context-dependent uh, patterns of alternate gene expression uh, in this population. And that's not necessarily surprising because the, the, these fibroblasts don't know they're in a the dish, they're, they're, they think they're supposed to be in a human, they're trying to work out what they should do next. So. Uh, clearly, uh, when you sample a complex population of cells, even what you expect are relatively homogeneous, you're only seeing the transcripts which are expressed more commonly in most of the cells. And this is a theme I want to, to elaborate on in the next few slides because my, some of the criticism of this emergent world, the surprisingly uh, surprising world of non-protein coding RNAs is that many of them appear to be lowly expressed. And I'm going to show you they're not lowly expressed they're just expressed in very specific places. And that gives the superficial impression of being lowly expressed when you sequence a whole population of cells. Now, this is what we saw on this diagram here, the circus plot, uh, what we saw when we targeted regions which appeared to not be transcribed very extensively in these fibroblasts. In the next frame, I'm going to show you what we saw at some uh, iconic protein coding loci in the same experiment. So for comparison, we selected a a number of protein coding loci from the genome, uh, that, like P53, some home ox genes, etc., to see what the difference would be between conventional deep sequencing and then targeted deep sequencing of those loci at high resolution by this methodology. And what we saw was extraordinary. In this particular graph, you can see in the outside in green, the uh, protein coding transcripts, the expected ones mostly that we can assemble by conventional uh, RNA sequencing and assembly methodologies but on the inner circle of this circos plot, you can see all the additional transcripts and splice variants that you see when you actually target these sequences. And to put this into a little bit more context for you, in this one experiment, well, two experiments actually, because we sequenced foot and lung fibroblasts, we discovered four new isoforms of P53, um, three of which uh, radically changed the domain structure of the protein. Now, P53, as you probably know, is a very intensively studied gene and protein. 
maybe the most intensively studied uh, protein in molecular biology, maybe uh, of the order of 10,000 publications, and yet in one extraordinarily important protein in both normal biology and cancer, and in one experiment we discover four new isoforms of this. In fact, I can tell you uh, uh, just uh, informally that we've now repeated this experiment for all the oncogenes and tumor suppressor loci and discovered uh, three and a half thousand new exons in the in, in tumor suppressor and oncogenes and, uh, and, and increased the numbers of isoforms enormously by just taking this approach to looking at the complexity of this population. I can illustrate it also by looking at homeotic gene transcripts. You'll know that Hox genes are very important in human uh, development and they've been intensively studied. In this experiment we discovered uh, a whole range of new um, uh, Hox messenger RNA isoforms and also novel non-coding RNAs. And if you look at the uh, panel B in this picture here, you can see that the tag frequency, which is the number of sequence tags we get uh, from, from this region uh, by conventional sequ sequencing was maxed out at about 20. But after we took the same preparation and, and captured these transcripts on beads and enriched for them, we get a thousand fold enrichment and now our signal strength is 20,000. And that's why we're able to pick up what are relatively rare events, which are really cell type specific events uh, that are not normally visible. Uh, in the next slide, um, oh, the majority of these transcripts are in fact differentially expressed. And here, this is just a non-protein coding loci where pre-capture in this deep sequencing data set, we picked up uh, tags which gave us three exons, two splice junctions. Um, and whereas after capture, you can see from this uh, diagram, the extraordinary complexity of this non-protein coding locus. And this is another feature of these non-protein coding loci is that they're also, like protein coding genes, differentially spliced, which uh, has structure function implications that we'll get to later. You can also see uh, the difference in the uh, sensitivity of this analysis on the right between pre-capture and post-capture. So, so, so the lesson to take away from this is that uh, there is an extraordinary complexity of the human transcriptome uh, that is vastly undersampled, even now, in both protein coding and non-coding space, that we have a long way to go to understand the full trans transcriptional complexity of any region of the human genome during human ontogeny differentiation and in disease. In fact, uh, it looks as if the human transcriptome is at least an order of magnitude, maybe two or more orders of magnitude more complex than the human genome. And the, the expression that I like to use now is to to regard the human genome as the zip file extraordinaire because this genome is unzipped to produce different transcripts, different spice isoforms, different clusters of transcripts and different relationships in different cells, every stage of differentiation and development. An extraordinarily sophisticated and complex uh, gene expression profile that when you get under the hood with deep sequencing technologies like this one that you see that's really quite stunning. So, um, one of the issues that came up, and I just want to take a sidebar here for a moment, uh, is that uh, how do you distinguish protein coding and non-coding RNAs? Uh, because many of the people who uh, um, are surprised by these uh, observations that were many non-protein coding transcripts being produced from human cells, uh, uh, you know, were concerned that we're really just picking up protein coding RNAs. And, and our original response was, well, we can never say for sure whether something is coding or not, because particularly with long RNAs, there's often small open reading frames in them. But uh, we felt that surely there weren't, uh, you know, tens of thousands of previously undiscovered protein coding genes in the genome. So in combination with Marcel Dinger and people in my laboratory, we decided to attack this problem by, uh, you know, uh, looking at the criteria for um, calling these things and then going back and doing a reverse mapping, as I'll show you. So, so you're probably aware that most genes in the human genome have been, this, most protein coding genes have actually been defined by messenger RNA sequencing because the fragmented exonic structure of protein coding genes, the genome means the genome sequence is very difficult to assemble into open reading frames. So when you sequence uh, uh, messenger RNA, poly -A RNA preps, you, you look at the open potential open reading frames and the operational definition for a protein coding sequence has been a likely protein coding sequence, I should say, is something that has uh, an open reading frame greater than 100 amino acids. There is some statistical sense to that, but in the interest of time, I won't go into it. That's just an operational definition. The problem is that you have a high rate of false negatives because we know there are small proteins, many hormones that have, uh, uh, that, uh, have coding sequences less than 100 codons long. And we also get high rate of false positives because we have um, randomly uh, occurring open reading frames in these um, uh, 
uh, these non locating RNAs. Now, you, you can compare these ORFs with uh, known functional domains, but and you can also look at the conservation, and that is to compare synonymous versus non synonymous mutation rates, which would be indicative of uh, selection for protein coding sequences. This, uh, this procedure is relatively unbiased, but it's highly dependent on the availability of autologous gene sequences. And when the original annotation of the human genome was done, there was really only human, mouse, maybe dog and cow, a few others, but uh, to do this with. And so uh, the statistical um, uh, certainty for doing this analysis was low. Of course, this will all change with the 10,000 vertebrate genomes project, which we expect to be completed over the next few years. And when you have that density of uh, genomic sequence information, uh, the statistical uh, significance of synonymous versus non-synonymous mutation rates will become very high. And we should be able to unequivocally and with high um, certainty pick every protein coding sequence in the, in the uh, human genome or any other genome. But in the meantime, uh, we decided to, uh, to look at this problem by integrating our transcriptome or transcriptomic data with proteomics data to try to identify which, cell, which RNAs were really protein coding and which ones were not. I'll move through this quickly in the interest of time because I, I see I'm lagging behind. Um, but basically, we got deep sequencing data uh, early from Illumina of some 16 different human tissues. We had several billion reads that we could assemble into transcriptome. And then what we did was to basically uh, assemble the transcriptome and then reverse uh, map or reverse translate peptides from the considerable mass spectrometry databases out there, the PRIDE databases and others to see if we could get unequivocal matches of uh, these peptide tags to open reading frames in our transcriptional transcriptome data sets. We extend the open reading frame and then we predict the proteins. Now this analysis very pleasingly uh, successfully predicted the vast majority of all annotated protein coding genes in the database, uh, which says that the, the, the analysis was pretty robust. And by the way, that most of the ones that were missing were, were genes uh, like uh, proteins like keratin, which were not in the uh, in, in the transcriptome database because we hadn't had uh, data from skin. So basically we were pretty confident that we had uh, high, high um, resolution uh, identification of protein coding genes. But in the same exercise, we also uh, picked up uh, several thousand uh, other loci and over 2,000 with two or more peptides mapped. And once you get two or more peptides uniquely mapping by reverse tr translation, then you start to get some confidence that these may be real rather than uh, noise, although one can never be certain until one does all the, the validations. In, in, in any case, um, we did discover that when we map these, uh, these uh, putative new proteins, most of them, as we might have predicted at the outset, are small in this gray range between 60 and 200 amino acids long, where it's difficult to call an open reading frame with any, uh, to be protein coding with any confidence, or it was difficult. So, uh, this suggests that you know there is uh, of the order maybe of a couple of thousand uh, plus or minus uh, undiscovered and uncharacterized well now now discovered but uncharacterized protein coding loci in the genome. We're not suggesting for a moment that this is a complete analysis. There'll be other ones that we've missed for various reasons, and some of these will be false positives. But nevertheless, uh, looking at those that are that are highly confident. Uh, we find that many of these uh, um, new protein coding loci are lineage specific, some are uh, vertebrate specific, some are tetrapod specific, some are amniote specific, some are mammal specific, and some are primate specific. Uh, most of them are tissue specific, they're heart specific, renal specific, brain specific, and intriguingly, over 200 have very strong uh, predicted secretion signals, which suggests that we have picked up a large number of potential new hormones because these are small proteins that are secreted and which hadn't been picked up by conventional biochemical analysis. So again, we have a long way to go to understand uh, the protein coding repertoire of the human genome as well as the non-protein coding repertoire. Returning to that, this uh, same analysis showed that the vast majority of the non-protein coding RNAs in our databases had no evidence of translation. That is, no evidence of any peptide fragments that mapped to them, but they did uh, show all of the indices of functionality of real genes. And I won't read through this list, uh, people can look at this later. The references uh, on the right here are, are in this uh, paper that is listed at the bottom of the slide. But just to make a, uh, some quick highlights, um, these, these non-protein coding RNAs, uh, as I said, show all of the indices of being real genes. They have dynamic expression patterns, their expression is altered in cancer and other diseases. 
the, uh, chromo the chromosome loci have particular chromatin signatures which are quite indicative of active genes and they have very, very uh, intriguing expression patterns. And I'm going to show you some quick examples of this. Before I do, uh, recently we did an analysis of the stability of these RNAs because many people have the misimpression that the RNA is quite unstable. They may be when you homogenize cells, but uh, in vivo they're actually quite stable. And these non-protein coding RNAs, genome-wide, show a similar range of stabilities to protein coding RNAs, from quite stable RNAs to quite unstable ones. Uh, and, and this is the same with protein coding sequences. But for example, in protein coding space, you know, things like actins or caseins in milk have very stable messenger RNAs, whereas transcription factors have quite unstable messenger RNAs because they presumably for more dynamic control. So again, these, uh, these uh, transcripts which are produced from genomic loci, uh, which do not go on to be translated, show all of the structural and expression and stability range features of messenger RNAs. Now, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this slide shows some work we did in conjunction with the Alan Brain Institute in Seattle some years ago, which looked at over a thousand of these non-protein coding RNAs and their expression patterns in mouse brain. And in these panels here, each uh, at the top of the pair shows the primary in situ hybridization data uh, and then the computer uh, transformation in the second panel to increase the, the contrast and resolution on the left of the controls. If you would look at panel B at the, uh, in the hippocampus, you see that the particular non-coding RNA that we're uh, looking at in this particular case is only expressed in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, as far as we know. In panel C, we see another one which is quite strongly expressed in a particular subfield of the hippocampus, CA1 subfield, I think. Others are in B, D, uh, sorry, D, E and F, which show different expression patterns. Now, the point here is that uh, we can see these non-coding RNAs relatively easy by the, uh, easily by the relatively insensitive technique of in-situ hybridization. And yet if you homogenize these brains and did deep sequencing on these samples, you'd be lucky to see these transcripts because they're only expressed in a very limited number of cells. And this is quite, uh, this is the experience that many labs are working in this area, that these uh, non-protein coding RNAs in fact are uh, quite easily detectable and seem to be reasonably highly expressed in the cells in which they're expressed, but they're very precisely expressed. On average, and I stress on average because there are exceptions both ways, but on average, more precisely expressed than most protein coding genes. And that is consistent with the idea that these RNAs are involved in controlling the architecture of the system, as I'll show you through the epigenetic trajectories of the system. Now, just to move through this quickly, if you look at the cortex there or the cerebellum, you see quite beautiful and very specific patterns of expression of these RNAs. We uh, looked at over 1,300 of them. Most are expressed in brain, 60 ubiquitously. Nobody has a clue what they do. And, and, and most of the ones that are expressed in brain show these very specific expression patterns. They also show very specific subcellular localization patterns. We have uh, non-coding RNAs which are localized to the cytoplasm, others to the nucleus, and these are mostly probably chromatin lo uh, localized, as I'll show you. Others to twin foci. This is in uh, the Purkinje cells. We thought these, uh, these, uh, this uh, bipolar structure might be centrosomes, but working with Bodo Lang in Berlin, we are unable to co-localize centrosomal markers to these structures. So we now know that Purkinje cells have an unknown and as yet uncharacterized subnuclear structure that as far as we know is unique to Purkinje cells and presumably is intimately uh, linked to the function of these cells. Others are localized to paraspecules or to neurites. Uh, in the, following this, uh, uh, we showed along with David Spector at Cold Spring Harbor that uh, some of these RNAs are actually central components of enigmatic subnuclear structures called paraspecules, which appear to be differentiation specific and mammal specific. Nobody's quite sure what their, their biological role is, but it's intriguing that these things do not appear to occur in other animals. And so there's some ostensibly uh, mammal specific function which has evolved, which is required for cell, in, in cell differentiation. Again, another mystery. Uh, another one of these non-coding RNAs is uh, particularly localized in what appear to be, and probably are, spliceosomes, a novel nuclear domain in a very specific subset of neurons. And just to move through quickly, because this has been published, in conjunction with Shinichi Nakagawa and Seth Blackshaw at uh, Hopkins, we recently showed this particular RNA is acutely regulated in response to neuronal activation, is actually associated with many of the proteins that have been uh, implicated in schizophrenia, and uh, appears to be involved in global changes to protein splicing patterns in response to nerve activation. 
So we're starting to get a hint that some of these, not surprisingly in retrospect, some of these non-protein coding RNAs may have an intimate role in uh, normal brain function and in, in, in disease. And perhaps I should just make a quick point here. It's becoming increasingly obvious to us uh, with some of the published but mainly unpublished knockouts of these long non-coding RNAs that many of them do not show a physical phenotype in developmental space, but many do, or appearing to, show cognitive phenotypes. And my feeling now is that much more of human genetic programming and mammalian genetic programming is devoted to, to cognitive functions than we had anticipated before. And of course, that's a tremendous selective advantage. But uh, time will tell uh, as we start to explore these things. Now, over the last uh, few years, my, um, my lab and others, but uh, have looked at the dynamic expression of these long, long coding RNAs at different stages of differentiation development. And uh, this just shows a summary of some of the papers we've published on this, looking at the dynamic expression in embryonal stem cell development, T cell activation, muscle differentiation, neuronal cell differentiation, as well as uh, in uh, breast cancer memory development and melanoma. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of vignette examples from these studies, just to put some biological substance to the potential role of these, uh, these this army of long, long coding RNAs. But before I do, I'd like to just say that uh, two things. One is that we, there are now uh, a few hundred examples of these RNAs showing biological function in the, in the published literature and many more en route to publication. And when you've got you know, 100, 200, 300 of these published cases, it's a big enough subset to say that this is not some sort of transcriptional noise, but these things have real biological roles and biological functions. The other thing, <coughs> excuse me, is to say that whenever we look at a differentiation transition like muscle development or differentiation or, or melanoma uh, disease uh, state, we find that 10 to 15 percent at least of these RNAs show statistically significant uh, changes in the patterns of their expression. And that gives us a tremendous range uh, of, of things to work with. We, we can use microarrays and other devices to, to pick the ones that are most highly differentially expressed and then go and study them. And many of these RNAs, or most in our experience and that of others, are susceptible to shRNA or siRNA mediated knockdown strategies and will show, at least in uh, cell culture, a phenotype. So let me give you two, two examples. Um, we looked at the differential expression of these uh, long, long coding RNAs. We looked at over uh, 10 or 15,000 of them, along with messenger RNAs in mouse memory development. And we get a fairly conventional ranking of the differential expression of different RNAs and the heat map on the right here. If you zoom in on this and look at the ones that are most differentially expressed, uh, you can select these for a study. We looked at, uh, for various reasons, the second one here, <coughs> excuse me, which is nearby antisense to a uh, zinc finger uh, transcription factor gene, ZNF NFX1. It doesn't overlap, but it's antisense on the upper strand nearby. Now, this uh, particular RNA is highly expressed in pregnant mammary gland, is, um, is turned off in lactation, and then turned back on again in weaning. Now remember this, this is down in lactation. So if we uh, look at the uh, behavior of this uh, thing in memory epithelial cells in culture, on the panel on the left we show, <coughs> excuse me, forgive me, uh, that many that this particular RNA is extraordinarily stable in an actinomycin D transcriptional block experiment, whereas the associated nearby protein coding gene shows a fairly conventional half-life. So here's an example of an RNA that is extraordinarily stable in vivo. And we think that's probably because it's chromatin associated, something we'll get to in a moment. If we knock down this RNA in mammary epithelial cells in culture, we increase the proliferation of these cells. Remember, it's down in lactation. We knock it down in culture, the cells proliferate. But more interestingly, more compellingly, in the right-hand panel here, we show that if we knock it down, we not only increase the number and the size of domes that form in these memory epithelial cells at confluency in culture. So in confluency, these cells will form three-dimensional domes. Uh, and if we knock down this RNA, those domes increase in number and size. But spectacularly, in the final uh, panel on the right, we increase uh, the level of casein production, uh, the major milk protein, by over an order of magnitude. So these cells start producing milk in culture when we block this RNA, which is exactly what we see in vivo. Our interpretation of this data is that this RNA is a state-specific controller that is regulating the expression of the switch from one epigenetic state to another in the lactation process. 
quickly in the next uh, slide, I'm just going to show you if it'll come up. It seems to be blocked. There we are. Uh, a similar experiment we did with Ranjan Pereira at the Burnham Institute in, in Florida uh, in looking at non-coding RNAs associated with melanoma. And we looked for RNAs which were highly expressed in melanoma cells in culture, but not in melanocytes, normal melanocytes or keratinocytes. And we focused on this one, which is a small intronic RNA, which is encoded antisense in the intron of this protein coding gene. Now, a couple of quick points to make here as well. Firstly, um, this RNA appears not to be conserved. And the whole uh, area of conservation is misunderstood and misinterpreted. A quick point to you, conservation clearly imputes function because the evolution is saying these sequences are important. But lack of conservation doesn't impute anything because there has to be differences between us and each other and other species. Of course, by definition, they won't be conserved. So this particular sequence is not conserved in pan mammalian conservation. Um, whereas, for example, the nearby on the left, an intronic sequence is extraordinarily highly conserved. So presumably this part of the intron of this gene is encoding an RNA signal, which is important for general mammalian uh, development or physiology. Whereas the one that we're looking at here appears to be primate specific and appears to be conserved just within primates. So the fact that it doesn't appear to be conserved in pan-mammalian conservation doesn't really mean anything, although the reciprocal does. So the second thing is that um, this uh, RNA has a very highly predicted secondary structure uh, that's conserved within primates. And, and when you look at this uh, structure, you, you can make two quick points. The first is that RNA is not a wiggly line with a bunch of A's on the end of it. It's a very sophisticated two and three dimensional molecule that can put hydrogen bonds on all three faces the Watson Crick face, the Hookstein face, and the ribose face, because the two prime hydroxyl. And these domains, we think, are domains that interact with proteins in very uh, domain specific ways. So, uh, so we think that these RNAs, and I'll show you this as we unfold the next few slides, are actually adapters that actually are bringing um, uh, complex of, of generic proteins, and particularly chromatin modifying proteins, to their sites of action. And that the open sections of these RNAs that are exposed. Uh, are these surfaces or the faces by which they can interact in a very specific, sequence specific way with other RNAs and DNA. So um, with this particular RNA, just to show you the biological function, this is upregulated in melanoma cells coming to the melanocytes. If we knock it down, we can actually reduce the invasive melanoma cells. The qualitative pictures are shown on the right. So as we increase the amount of siRNA, we can reduce the invasiveness of these cells the quantitative data on it is on the left. The, in this case, we did the reciprocal experiment, which is ectopic expression, and I, I can't show you the data because it's a movie which didn't uh, transfer well in this, uh, in this format. But basically, if we overexpress this RNA, we uh, radically increase the uh, mobility, motility, and invasiveness of these cells. So knocking it down reduces their invasiveness, uh, turning it up increases their inv invasiveness of cells. So here is an RNA, a regulatory RNA. It clearly does not encode a protein, but which is centrally involved in regulating the invasiveness and motility of these cells, and, and clearly must be a factor in the metastatic transformation uh, in melanoma. Now, the clue to what these things did uh, do uh, generically was uh, revealed by this and some other experiments I'll show you. This was uh, data we published some years ago, looking at the dynamic expression of these RNAs in, uh, during embryonic stem cell differentiation in culture. It's a bit of a mess. You go from stem cells uh, at the outset at day zero and you differentiate them and you get a mess of mesoderm and endoderm of, uh, appearing over the ensuing couple of weeks. Um, this graph only has two protein coding loci, OC4, which is a marker of uh, stem cell or pluripotency, and brachyuri, which is uh, upregulated uh, around the time of primitive streak formation, which is a crossover point. So you can see hundreds of these RNAs which are either being turned off, these are non-coding RNAs, the rest of them, or turned on differentially during this process in vitro, differentiation process. Now I'm going to concentrate on uh, this EVX1 antisense uh, RNA, which is non-coding RNA opposite the EVX1 homeotic gene, and one other opposite are Hox genes uh, in the following slides. Because what, what, this, um, what this analysis showed was not only that many of these long non-coding RNAs have expression profiles that correlate with markers of stem cell differentiation, but that they have a particular association. So, before I talk about the, uh, the, the blot at the bottom right there, which is the main data point, if you look at the top panel A, you will see that um, the Hox B5, B6 antisense RNA 
uh, transverses on the other strand there entirely, the Hox B5 and B6 lockers, and you'll see the exon structure is quite distinct. If you look at the EVX1 antisense RNA, it partially overlaps the EVX1 homeotic gene, and again has a very distinct exon structure, showing the precise organisation of the genome. And, and most of these RNAs are alternatively spliced as well. So we have a very sophisticated interlacing exon structure of these uh, both coding and non-coding RNAs at any given locus. Now the important data point, as I indicated, is down in the bottom right here, which showed for the first time that these antisense RNAs specifically co uh, precipitate with antibodies against the trithorax protein, MLL1, which is a, an epigenetic uh, chromatin uh, modifying protein, activating protein, or with antibodies against uh, histone 3 uh, trimethyl uh, lysine 4, which is an indicator of active, active chromatin. The messenger RNA, HOXB6, does not co localize with uh, this trithorax protein or this modified histones. The EVX1 antisense does as well whereas the HOXA11 antisense uh, RNA does not, and we think is probably associated with another form of chromatin modifying complex, likely a polycone. So what this uh, data showed was that these differentiation through transcripts associated with chromatin modifying complex and modified histones. Now, I just want to quickly say that uh, these epigenetic processes, uh, for those who are not familiar with them, are, which are central to dif differentiation development. In fact, they're probably the supervisory level above transcription factors in, in terms of controlling human development. Now, that might seem uh, odd to some people in the audience, but basically you can trump these things by ectopically producing, uh, sorry, expressing transcription factors like MNARCA factors or MyOD, and the cells will respond to a enforced state-specific transcription factor. But in, but in fact, the very subtle and sophisticated development of a human in all the different uh, cells and tissues and the architecture is being supervised at the top level by epigenetic processes that organize the chromatin in different ways. They also, these processes are essential to long-term to, uh, long response to environmental variables and to brain function. Uh, this is embedded, this, this epigenetic process memory is embedded in the chemical modification both of the cytosines and DNA, an extraordinarily wide range of modifications of the tails of the histones that package DNA in the nucleosomes. Uh, but these modifications are catalyzed by a, a relatively limited number of generic enzymes or chromatin modifying complexes that of, impose a myriad of these different chemical marks at literally millions now we know of genomic locations in different cells at different stages of differentiation. If you go into the ENCODE data and look at these uh, fantastically sophisticated chromatin uh, uh, maps, you can see that these this landscape is incredibly sophisticated in, in every locus and in every, every state, different cell line. So the question arises, what determines the site selectivity of these different enzymes? In other words, because these enzymes are methylate or ubiquinolate or, or acetylate, the histones or, or methylate the DNA, are generic, what, what is targeting them to their different sites in different cells at different stages of differentiation? The, other, the second question is what determines the positioning of nucleosomes, is that important? And I'll show you very briefly that it is. And finally, what's the molecular basis of the epigenome environmental interactions that underpin such things as uh, cancer progression and type 2 diabetes, for example? And in, in short, the answer to all of these three questions is, is RNA. But the, the main function of this army of uh, long non coding RNAs is to act as adapters to bring these uh, generic enzymes, chromatin modifying complexes, their sites of action in very specific ways. Now, we weren't the only ones to, to come to this conclusion. The uh, wonderful groups working in, uh, in printed genes in humans showed that maternally or paternally imprinted genes are actually silenced or activated by, by non-coding RNAs that target uh, polycone complexes like G9A to chromatin to shut down or open up the, the lineage. And this is just a couple of papers from Peter Fraser's group in Cambridge and Kanduri's group in Uppsala, but there are others as well. And then more recently, uh, our friend and colleague John Ritt at Harvard uh, writ this large by looking at over 3,300 of these uh, long non coding RNAs and showed that roughly 20% 20 of them actually bound to polycone complex PRC2, and others were bound by other chromatin modifying complexes and showed by selecting a subset of these for knockdown experiments that they behaved as if. Uh, they were controlling these epigenetic processes normally imposed by these enzymes. So, you, uh, in summary, and this was obvious some years ago, this is a review that uh, we wrote a few years ago. It's uh, been updated more recently, but it's a nice uh, summary diagram. 
which shows that not only D do long non-coding RNAs recruit chromatin repressor complexes or chromatin activating complexes to target loci, but also that there are many other small RNA pathways, including pathways associated with the RNA interference pathway, which are also involved in ways we really don't yet understand in, in, in an extraordinarily precise organization of the chromatin at different regions of the genome at different stages of differentiation and development. And this is a world that's just beginning to open up to us. And it's, uh, as I've just reinforced, it's not just long, non-cutting RNAs, but small RNAs like pyRNAs, et cetera, and microRNAs. And many of the components of the RNA interference pathway, contrary to the widely accepted uh, dogma, are actually active in the nucleus. So we have a long way to go to understanding the sophistication and the mechanisms of these RNA regulatory pathways in controlling chromatin architecture in human cells and ultimately in supervising developmental trajectories. Uh, I have to move quickly now, so I'm going to, uh, this slide will progress. It's not progressing for me. Um, apologize for that. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is a review that uh, Tim Mercer uh, and I wrote uh, recently for NSMV, which just attempts to, to rationalize this landscape. And I think I won't dwell on this. It's published and you can look at this diagram later, but essentially it really uh, posits, and there's good experimental evidence for all of these, that RNAs actually act as scaffolds uh, and, and, and guides to assemble very complex, uh, sophisticated protein complexes and target them to their sites of uh, um, action in other RNAs, in DNA, and also that these things like proteins can uh, act allosterically with conformational switches. So there's a whole hidden layer of gene regulation here which was unexpected beyond transcription factors which supervises the generic architecture and organization of the chromatin to supervise putting trillions of cells in the right places in normal human ontogeny. And by the way, that process is very robust because if you have an identical twin with the same program, you get much the same outcome. So it's not stochastic. It's very highly organized, very highly precise. And I would put it to people generally that uh, any suggestion that there's any noise in the human genome is uh, probably fairly lazy uh, assumption, but, uh, and almost certainly, in my view, wrong, that this system is exquisitely organized, uh, and that's reflected in the exquisite precision of the developmental processes. Now, just quickly uh, moving through this, uh, we and some other, other groups showed a few years ago that the nucleosomes which organize our genome are actually preferentially positioned at exons. Uh, and this is genome-wide data now, 80,000 exons in the Z dimension of this graph, showing enrichment for DNA in, uh, from exons in nucleosomes. So this implies that the genome already knows where the exons are, and all of the people who discovered this in 2009, including us, speculated that this may be the basis of uh, the long uh, sought for explanation for differential splicing. Many people will be aware that splicing and transcription are closely coupled, uh, but nobody knew how or why. And basically, this suggests that uh, different genomic loci are not just epigenetically modified as a locus, but maybe each exon may be differentially uh, modified in this process, in a feed forward process to control splicing patterns. Now, if that's true, by the way, this says that this RNA layer, which is uh, guiding these modifying enzymes to, to these systems, is acting in a, in potentially an exon-specific way, which again speaks to the extraordinary precision and sophistication of the system. In any case, the prediction that this might have uh, some uh, relevance to alternative splicing by differential modification of different exons in a particular gene was uh, supported and uh, uh, by the paper in the following year from Rainey Lucco and Tom Mustelli's lab, which showed that uh, alternative splicing is regulated by histone modification. And I don't have time to go into it today, but we've just published a paper in Nature Genetics showing that alternatively spliced exons are preferentially complex with the promoter of genes in a giant transcription splicing complex in an exon specific and uh, cell specific manner. And for those of you interested in following that literature, the extraordinary sophistication and complexity of the three and four dimensional organization of chromatin to bring in alternatively spliced exons into complex of the promoter. Uh, just refer you to a recent issue of Nature Genetics, uh, uh, first author, Tim Mercer. So um, we also, uh, just to, to round this out, uh, uh, discovered uh, that there are other small RNAs, not just microRNAs or pyRNAs that are nuclear specific and we, there's a particular class of 18 nucleotide RNAs which are specifically associated with transcription initiation and splice sites and metazoans. We picked this up by deep sequencing of nuclear RNA in human THP1 cells, which shows in this graph in the colored thing, a peak of 
17, 18 nucleotide long RNAs which specifically localized at the three prime end of exons uh, at splice junctions, which are nuclear localized but not on the right uh, found in the cytoplasm. The signal here is so weak we only get 0.1 uh, tags per, per locus, but when you integrate through 80,000 or more uh, exons genome-wide you see a very strong signal. And now back to the envelope calculation is there's probably one or two of these RNAs per cell and therefore per allele. And, and uh, these things, uh, even though this whole cell data, we could also pick up when you do the same analysis in mice, flies, worms, and even sponges, the most primitive metazoa. You don't find them in plants, uh, and we, we think, and we have some preliminary evidence that these things may be involved in recording or controlling the position of nucleosomes in the genome. And, and our rationalization for their existence in animals, but not plants, is that in animals, you need much more precise control of the ontogeny of human plants, which have a more stochastic and, and, and context-dependent uh, developmental profile. Finally, and we're almost finished, uh, we have good evidence that uh, RNA is uh, the substrate for epigenetic and environmental interactions. And uh, I just refer the audience to this article if you're interested to follow up. This is a story for another day and one that's just unfolding. But just quickly, there is a, uh, a lot of evidence now that there's been a massive expansion in the a range uh, and repertoire of R enzymes that modify RNA uh, by editing, by deamination, particularly in the brain. And that the, R the RNA system, which had evolved to put fingers and toes in the right places in development, has then, by evolution, been rendered plastic to allow us to, to um, uh, adapt physiologically, but more importantly, to actually be able to uh, regulate our epigenome in context dependent ways for the evolution of cognition. So for those interested, I think I would just suggest this is a fascinating area. My prediction is that uh, this area of RNA editing, this plasticity of the transcriptome and therefore through the transcriptome, the epigenome, will be a major uh, area of research in both molecular biology and neuroscience for the next decade and beyond. So finally, and in conclusion, um, I look forward to your questions. Uh, the, uh, the the human genome is not a, um, a uh, oasis of protein coding sequences in the desert of junk. I think a better way of thinking about it is we have islands of protein coding sequences in a sea of regulation, most of which is transacted by RNA, and most of that is required to actually control the very sophisticated and complex epigenetic trajectories to put uh, cells in the right places. So RNA is not an ephemeral intermediate between gene and protein, as it largely is in bacteria, uh, although I think we underestimated its regulatory functions even there, but certainly in humans and other complex organisms, it's the computational engine of uh, cell biology, computational engine of development, and almost certainly the computational engine of cognition. So with that, um, I leave you and uh, to questions, and um, thank you very much for your time uh, today, and uh, look forward to discussing now or in the future by email uh, any observations or questions you may have. Thank you. So I'll go to questions now and see what's popped in. Nothing yet. Um, uh, so please feel free to type in questions if you're listening, and I'll be happy to address them. I'll repeat them on air and then uh, answer them as best I can. Well, I don't see any questions, so I, I, I hope I haven't lost you, um, either technologically or intellectually. Please, uh, please feel free to ask questions. And, um, and, uh, but maybe the, the presentation was extremely lucid and nobody's got any uh, questions or, or contrary views to put.
All right, well, um, it appears that uh, there are no questions coming in. Um, I'm not sure how to interpret that, but uh, if you are listening and you are interested, please, please feel free to contact me. Uh, my email address is j.mattick, M-A-T-T-I-C-K, at garvan, G-A-R-V-A-N, dot org, dot A-U. Um, and forgive me if I don't reply immediately, but I will get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you for your time today. Goodbye.